Okay, so for today's Matthew 20 Bible study, uh, this will take us to Jesus' parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And this parable is an illustration of what Jesus talked about and he mentioned in the very previous chapter in Matthew 19, where he said that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So let's just back up just a little bit to Matthew 19 and get the context for today's sermon, uh, because Jesus goes on to explain what he meant by that in the current chapter. But let's read Matthew 19, 28 through 30. And it says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. And then in verse 30, but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. So this is kind of a cryptic saying of Jesus on the surface. What did Jesus mean when he said that the first shall be last and the last shall be first? So Jesus goes on to explain what he meant in Matthew 20, 1 through 16, where we'll begin our Bible study. Looks like I woke up the baby. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So Matthew 20, 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So he grabs these laborers, he hires these laborers in this parable, the master of the vineyard, he hires for himself laborers, and he agrees to pay them a penny a day. And a penny a day might not sound like a lot to us today, it's not, but that was a Roman denarius. And the Roman denarius was a day's wage for a Roman soldier. And the Roman soldiers were paid well. You know, they had to deal with the Jews, the stiff-necked Jews at the time, the Pharisees, you know. Um, and the, the rebellion, they were under a province, you know. Uh, Rome was the province. And so the Roman soldiers, just in general, were, were paid well. And so a penny or a denarius was a generous amount for a day's work, for a day's labor. And so he hires them out for a generous amount. Uh, suffice it to say it was, again, it was just a day's work. It was going day by day, paying them day by day. In verse 3, and it says, And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And so with the first group, where, which it says he went early in the morning, he, it says which in verse 1, which went out early in the morning. So the first group was early in the morning. It was the start of the day, and he offered to pay them a specific amount, which was a penny. But with the second group, he goes out about the third hour, which is 9 a.m., and we'll get, we'll get to that in a minute, how I, how I know it's 9 a.m. And, and how the Jews looked at uh, biblical time in the days. But he goes out about the third hour, which is 9 a.m., and he hires other laborers into the vineyard, but he doesn't specify how much he's going to pay them. He doesn't offer them a penny. He just simply says, I will pay you what is right. And so that's what he offers them, uh, the ones that he hires on the third day. He says, whatsoever is right, I will give you. And again, this was done on the third hour, which according to Jewish biblical time is 9 a.m. So the third hour, by the way, is when Jesus was crucified. We see that in Mark 15, 25, and it was the third hour and they crucified him. So we see a linkage to the atonement, the crucifixion, the doctrine of salvation there. It was also at the third hour that Peter was accused of being drunk at Pentecost. We see that in Acts 2.15. For these are not drunken, Peter says, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. And so it was early in the morning. Peter was like, they're not drunk. They're just filled with the Holy Spirit. And it was 9 a.m. It was, it was early morning. So to the first group, 
He'd gone, it says, early in the morning. It was probably closer to 6 a.m. when the day would officially start in the Jewish time frame, in the Jewish time zone. And it was, it was probably around 6 a.m. when the daylight hours began. That was the very start of the day. So Jesus went at probably around 6 a.m. and then also at 9 a.m. where he hired that second group. So talking about Jewish time and you know trying to understand the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, the Jews basically divided the 24-hour day into two major subdivisions. You had night and day, or evening and morning, or darkness and light. That's how the Jews thought about the day. They would divide the 24-hour day into two major subdivisions, dark and light. And we know biblically, as we see in Genesis, the day began in the evening, and it went until the next morning. And so the morning was just simply the, the daylight hours. And so the day began in the evening at the start of dark. That would be at the very beginning of evening when dark would set. And it would go until the end of the morning or the end of the light hours. And that would be the 24 hour period. So you had light and dark. And uh, that was the night and day that God separated in the very beginning. Remember, God separated the light from the darkness. And so that's what we see, this division uh, within time and, and the day. So then further, what the Jews would do is take the, the light hours or the day hours, and they would then subdivide those hours, those 12, that 12 hours of, of light or however long it was, um, they would further divide that into four subdivisions starting at very early, you know, early in the morning. The day would start at 6 a.m. And then the third hour was three hours later from that. So that would be 9 a.m. And then the sixth hour would be six, hour, six hours later. That would be 12 p.m. And the ninth hour would be 3 p.m. So that was how the day was separated. It was the third hour, sixth hour, and the ninth hour, which is uh, you know, three. Uh, sorry, 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. And then, if you do the math, the 12th hour would be 6 p.m. Even though they didn't mention the 12th hour in the Bible, it was just that would be the next logical thing, which would bring us to the evening or to the dark hours. So that's how they subdivided the day, and um, and we see that that's how the Jews would measure time. That's how the Jews in, in biblical time. Uh, that's how they thought about time. So we understand that now. And then Matthew 20, verse 5, it says, Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. So again, that would have been 12 p.m. and 3 p.m. He hired four different groups starting at 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. And they were to work until the day hours were, were over. Okay, so we see him, you know, the, the master of the vineyard hiring laborers to work in his vineyard all the day long. He wants people from all, you know, from all, all the time. He wants everyone to come in and to work in his vineyard. Anybody that, that, would, that was willing, that was standing around looking to enter into his vineyard would be hired. And so all day long he's out there hiring. In verse 6, in about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? So even up until the eleventh hour, that's the last hour of light of you know of the day, it would have been five PM. So he goes out uh, an hour before uh, the day labor day was going to the day of you know time and to labor was going to be over during the day at the last hour at the eleventh hour, and he hires more people. Verse seven, they say unto him, because no man hath hired us, he saith unto them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. And so he agrees to pay all of them what is right, except that first group, which he offers specifically a day's wages. In verse 8, So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. So now we see this is really an explanation of what Jesus was talking about in the previous chapter. So Jesus here, he says, let's begin with the last 
and go to the first. He's kind of like that teacher who doesn't do things alphabetically, but reverse alphabetical. And I appreciated that because my last name started with a Y. So, you know, I, I can appreciate that uh, in school. That was, those are always the, the good <laughs> teachers, the fun teachers, right? So as soon as the, the day ends, though, at the 12th hour, he, he, he says, call all the laborers. Let's call all of them forward so they can all get paid. They're all going to get the reward do their labor in verse nine. And when they came that were, and when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. So he begins with the last and he gives them what is right, which he says is that same penny that he offered that first group. So the people who he had hired last had only worked for one hour. You know, it was the 11th hour. They'd only worked an hour and they got what he had promised those who'd, who'd he'd hired early in the morning at 6 a.m. You know, those people had been laboring all day long and they all get the same wages. Verse 10, but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more and they likewise received every man a penny. So they're all getting the same wage here, even though they all did different levels of work and labor. Okay. And so they're like, what? You know, these guys only work for one hour. Why do they get the same amount that we got in verse 11? And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house saying, these last have brought, have wrought but one hour and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. So they're like, we did all this work. We labored in the heat of the day in the hardest part of the day when the sun is out. These guys come at the 11th hour in the last hour and they, they get what we get. You know, they get the same exact thing, even though they didn't really labor that much or if at all, they were just kind of standing around idle. They come at the 11th hour and they get the same wages that, that the people at the third hour got. And so what Jesus was about to teach them was about eternal life and the grace of God. And that's what this parable is really about. He says to them in verse 13, but he answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that as thine and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last for many be called, but few chosen. Now with that last you know, a few words there, the, for many be called, but few chosen. We understand the context of this parable is salvation and eternal life. This is God's calling on the laborers in the vineyard. He wants them to come, whether you're at the first hour or at the 11th hour, you know, whether you're at ground zero, which was that very early in the morning at 6 a.m., or whether you came in at the very end at the 11th hour, maybe that symbolizes, you know, the end of the world, the last days, people who, or people who die at the very last moment, uh, and, and they believe right before they die. And so ultimately, this is really Jesus is teaching them about eternal life and the free gift of salvation. See, in the eternal realm, time and wages have no meaning. It's, it's all equalized in terms of salvation, in terms of eternal life, being granted into heaven, being granted eternal life. It doesn't matter if you labor for the kingdom for one hour or for an entire lifetime, the free gift of salvation is eternal life. And that's applied to everybody equally. That's that penny. That's that Roman denarius. It was that day's wages. You know, we're to live a day at a time and, and just do our, do our work here on earth. But salvation in this parable, Jesus is illustrating is ultimately free. It's a, it's eternal life. It's the same for everybody. The thief on the cross literally did nothing for Jesus or for the kingdom of God other than to repent and to believe the gospel. Okay. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. So the laborers who he hired all received that same wage, no matter how much they worked. And this is an illustration 
of the gospel. It's an equalizing factor under, you know, when it's eternal, it's, it's the same for everybody in terms of salvation. That doesn't speak to eternal rewards, which Jesus is going to get to in a minute uh, in the same chapter, which is by works. You know, eternal rewards are meted out purely by works, purely by merit, purely what you do for the Lord in this lifetime. But salvation itself is a free gift. So we see in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus promised them a generous day's wages. He gave them exactly what he told them he would give them. And that was one day's wages. He hired everybody that was standing idly by in the marketplace, wanting to enter into the vineyard. Anybody that was there that was willing, he would invite in, he would bring into his vineyard, and he would pay them the gift of eternal life, which is what that penny represented. It had to be the lowest denominator. It had to be, you know, just something that is, again, equalizing when we're considering eternal life. And so he says to them, take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. It makes no difference to God, the creator. Everybody uh, can equally enter the kingdom, no matter what they've done in this life and what they haven't done, as long as they repent and believe the gospel is, is what the word says. So, you know, and this got... This got to their self-righteous religious nature. That's why they were murmuring against the, the you know, good men of the house. It upset them that they were, you know, they did all this work. They, they labored in the heat of the day and they got the same thing that the people got at the 11th hour. They had worked hard. And these harlots and these sinners and these drunkards were getting into the kingdom ahead of the religious elite. And that's, that's again the message here because Jesus was speaking here in parables to the Jews. He was speaking to the Pharisees and the, and the Jews and saying that, you know, it's the harlots and the drunkards are going to enter heaven before you because of your self-righteousness, because you're trying to attain it by works when it's simply by faith. It was a rebuke of the self-righteous and the work salvationist and a revelation of Jesus Christ himself as the great equalizer, as the giver or dispenser of eternal life for free. It didn't cost them anything. And so Jesus said to the Pharisees in the next chapter in Matthew 21, 31, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Okay, because it wasn't about works. It was simply about understanding our sinful condition, understanding that we're sinners and understanding our need for a savior. Okay, so those who were also thought of as last or the least on earth would be the greatest or the first in the kingdom of heaven. You know, that's what, that's what this is ultimately about. Those who thought they were something in this life and thought they were first would actually be last in, in God's eyes. And so the parable of the laborers in the vineyard also teaches us what appears right in this world is not always right with God. You know, this is God's way of turning the world upside down. You know, today we live in the times of Isaiah 520. Isaiah 520, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Right? We're living those times right now. I mean, we see it every single day, every waking hour. You know, this world is completely backwards. And every day it feels like in this topsy turvy world that we're living in the twilight zone. I mean, that's every day that I wake up. You know, since March of 2020, it's like, which Twilight Zone episode are we going to live out today? And I mean, they're telling us how many people can be inside our own houses on Thanksgiving. You know, so I, I just want to publicly say that we're going to have family. We're going to have friends. You guys are all invited. Whoever wants to come for Thanksgiving, you know, just let me know. And we'll, you know, we want to make sure we, we, you know, cook enough food. So let us know if you're, you know, wanting to come to our place or if you already have family plans, you know, get together and invite friends, invite family. You know, I went to 
uh, Regen uh, Spokane Regional uh, Health District website, and I just you know reamed them with comments about how great of a Thanksgiving we're going to have. We need to do this publicly. Oh yeah, we need to, and that's what we need to see. We need to see people rise up. Don't hide it. They're not going to. What can they do to you? You know, they're not going to do anything. You know, defy, don't comply, you know, and make it bold, make it public. We're going to need lots of people to stand up against this. So that's the kind of world we're living in today. Um, and this, this parable, when Jesus says the first shall be last and the last shall be first, in other words, Jesus is teaching that heaven's value system is radically different than the world's value system. He turns things upside down. He takes evil and turns it into good, right? So the first shall be last and last shall be first. This was God's way of, of changing things, of turning the world upside down and exposing it in the meantime. So those who are esteemed and respected and successful in this world may not even make it to heaven, is, is what Jesus is teaching. But those who are downtrodden and despised and, and rejected of men, but who cling to Christ, will be saved. You know, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. The harlots will enter in, the prostitutes will enter in, the drunkards will enter in, the thief on the cross will enter in, but the self-righteous religious Pharisees are, you know, we know where they ended up, yeah. right? So that's what Jesus is teaching. The first shall be last and the last shall be first is a reversal of the way that the world operates today. It's when Jesus will set all things right, set all wrongs, you know, right, and change things uh, to the way that they're supposed to be. That's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 3, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we see this repeatedly throughout the Bible. God likes to take things and turn them upside down, take evil and, and turn it into good, take those who are mourning and say that they're going to be, you know, full of joy. So that's what the kingdom of God and salvation and eternal life brings us uh, through, through Christ's word here. So lastly, as I mentioned, Jesus was addressing the Jews, and the Jews had labored long <clears throat> in the Old Testament, and they were the first fruits to God, right, versus the Gentile newcomers in the New Testament who were last. Okay, the New, the New Testament saints didn't have to labor and keep the ceremony and the directives of the law as vigorously as the Jews had to do in the Old Testament. So this would provoke the Jews to jealousy, as we see here in the parable. Okay, so Romans 11.11 11 says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So again, he's speaking to the Jews. They're jealous, you know, they're saying they've, they've been laboring in, in the gospel, in the, in the Old Testament, in the ceremony of the law. They've been meticulous about keeping the law and the ordinances, doing the sacrifices. And it had to be very specific and, and very, you know, meticulous the way that they were doing things. And then here comes the New Testament saints and you just have to believe and just, you know, and that's it. You don't have to do any of that. And so Jesus here, and it's a multifaceted parable. He was speaking about the sense of you know fairness and, and, and not fairness in terms of salvation and how much you might have to work or not work for the kingdom, uh, and then also it's it's a it's a rebuke of the Jews who were feeling jealous that here comes Jesus and and the New Testament saints and the Gentiles are are going to be getting saved and they don't really have to do anything for it. So again, the first shall be last. The Jews who were the first fruits to God. You know, they were his chosen, the apple of his eye, but they rejected Christ, as we talked about last time. And the, uh, the non-believing, I mean, the believing, you know, Gentiles, the non-Jews were grafted into that same olive tree for free, you know. And so even though salvation was always for free, but they had to keep, they had to be stewards of the meticulousness of the law. Uh, to uphold that until Jesus would come. And so that's the general meaning of the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. 
And Matthew 20, 17 through 19 continues, and it says, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. So I've been telling you, you know, Jesus has been making his way to Jerusalem in the last few chapters. It's become, you know, a little bit more focused on that. They're kind of getting laser focused on we're, we're on our way, we're, we have a mission where um, Jesus is going to be the atonement. And that's his purpose to come and to die and to be the sacrifice. And so he now begins to prepare them, to prepare the disciples and the apostles for the fact that he's going to be betrayed into the hands of the Pharisees who are going to kill him and crucify him. And it says in verse 18, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these two my sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. So she's, she, here she is. This is, you know, the mother of James and John, the sons of thunder, uh, the mother of, you know, these two prominent apostles who would become prominent. And she's talking to the son of God. And she's like, let my, sin, let my son sit next to you in your kingdom. You know, I mean, talk about the Jewish mother here. She's like, you know, going up to Jesus. Can my sons please sit next to you, you know, in the kingdom here? And verse 22, but Jesus answered and said, you know not what you ask. Are you able to drink the, of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They just earned that, I think, by their pride there, you know. Uh, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. So they're like, sure, you know, we can, we can do what you're going to do, you know. Um, and he basically says that if this is what you want to strive for, if you want to do what I'm about to do, be prepared to be martyred in a horrific way. You know, that's, that's what he says to them. They don't understand what they're asking. And that cup that Jesus had to drink was the cup of God's wrath poured on him because the sins of the entire world were put on Jesus on the cross and he had to bear their sins. All the wrath, all the, you know, all the wrath of God himself would be placed on Jesus so that he can make that atonement. Now, these were Zebedee's children, the sons of thunder, as I mentioned, uh, John the Apostle and James, his brother, as opposed to James, the brother of Jesus. There's different James in the Bible. And Jesus's prediction or prophecy about these two disciples uh, came true. You know, James was stabbed through with a sword by Herod Agrippa. He was the first martyr, uh, the Christian martyr after um I think it was uh, Stephen and then and then James, but in terms of you know once the church was established, he was the first of the apostles to be to be martyred. And church tradition says that John the apostle either died of old age, a prisoner in the island of Patmos, or there's another tradition from the church, and you know none of this is mentioned in scripture, but his history says that he was either uh, you know on the island of Patmos where he died of old age, where he had the revelation. You know that that we that we read about uh, the book of Revelation, or that he was boiled in hot oil, and the Bible doesn't say you know exactly, but uh, that's certainly a possibility because Jesus said you know or you will drink of the cup that you know that that you've asked for. So John may have in fact you know that church tradition may have in fact been been true that he may have been after the island of Patmos he might have been uh, boiled in in hot oil. So Bible doesn't say so. We have to rely on history for that. But Jesus says that it's not even up to him who will sit in his kingdom, who will sit next to him in his kingdom, but that it's up to God the Father to make that determination. So one interesting thing about this is that the Bible does teach 
that there will be people who will sit next to Jesus in heaven and there'll be literally, you know, saints that will sit next to him on either side. And this will be done based on merit. And so this is where works come in. You know, salvation, he first goes on this, you know, in the self-contained chapter here, we see the doctrine of, free, of the free gift of salvation and, you know, eternal life. And we also see the doctrine of eternal rewards side by side. So, you know, salvation, again, is absolutely free. You can't earn even a penny of it, any of it. You can't earn it at all. It's either, you know, you have the substitute and the sacrifice, or you don't. You've been born again, or you haven't been born again. Or, um, you know, if you haven't been, of course, you know, you're not saved. Uh, but when it comes to rewards in the kingdom, eternal rewards in the kingdom, it's based 100% on our works and, and what we do with the talents and the gifts that, that we've been given. So, and this is a, a merit based on works that we do in an, in an entire lifetime. You know, so we have our entire life to work for the kingdom and we should be busy about doing that. So, again, he teaches in this parable that whether you're saved for a minute or a lifetime, you get the same reward of eternal life, but there is still eternal rewards and glory and authority in the kingdom of heaven that will be determined solely based on our works, and it is absolutely not free. That part you have to work for and be faithful to the Lord and follow after Jesus and have an eternal perspective, you know, because what we do here is, is so short. And, it, you know, the time will go by fast. And, you, you know, some of you younger don't might not realize that. But as we get older, I mean, that time just, it goes by. And, you know, do the works that you can for Christ right now. And so we have both of those doctrines in this chapter. In Matthew 20, 24, it says, And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. They're like, what? Jesus said James and John are going to sit in his kingdom, you know, next to him. And, and so they kind of, you know, out of their zeal of, of wanting the same thing, they, they misunderstand the whole situation. And they're indignant about that. They're angry about that. You know, we can see how much the, the apostles will grow. This is at the very beginning of, you know, of those three years of, of Jesus's ministry. But verse 25 says, but Jesus called unto them and said, "Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for ministry. So what we see Jesus doing here, again, he's, he's reiterating that although salvation is free, there's tons of incentive and reason for us to be holy, to be faithful to God, and to take that very seriously. But we also see what, what Jesus does here is again, he flips things around. You know, we see this pattern of flipping things around. You know, the great shall be the least among you. The, the leader will be the servant, you know. And, and so he teaches this new idea, this New Testament idea of servant leadership. You know, the first, again, shall be last, and the last shall be first. The chief and the greatest among you should be and is the servant of all. And so that's, that's a very New Testament principle rooted in the Old Testament, but it really, it comes out, you know, in a, in a great way in the New Testament. And so Jesus introduces that servant minister role within the church, and, and we see it uh, throughout. I mean, we see it in Luke 9, 4, where Jesus says, For he that is least among you, all the same shall be great. And Paul also said in Romans 12, 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Right? So we're to be lowly and, and humble in heart. And so the greatest leaders are going to be those that, that serve the most and are the most humble. And so we see examples of that of Jesus himself living this way when he, for example, washes the feet of his disciples. 
And uh, Jesus models this servant leadership role within the, tr- uh, within the church as a true method of leadership. And so he sets that standard for humility. He says in verse 28, in Matthew 20, 28, he says that he's to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's the ultimate sacrifice. That's the ultimate service. He's going to give his own life in order to save everybody else, in order to save many. And so Jesus was the ransom. He paid for the full penalty of sin, death, and hell. And uh, this had to be paid. You know, this had to be paid. Otherwise, God would not be just. You know, there would be no justice. Justice, truth, holiness would become meaningless if Jesus and God could just let everybody into the kingdom and everybody would get saved, even if you didn't believe the gospel. Because, you know, if it's, if it's just uni- if it's universalism, there would be no meaning to, to anything that, that Jesus has done. And so he paid the price, and uh, there would be no justice or holiness if he hadn't. He became that ransom. And Matthew 20 ends with verses 29 through 34. And it says, And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. So this, these people here, these blind men, were acknowledging Jesus' Messiahship. They called him the son of David. And here was a perfect example of people who were outcast, who were unwanted. They were literally the last. You know, there are these blind uh, beggars, probably, or they were just, you know, blind and they were outcast. They couldn't do anything in society. They were downtrodden. And the multitude was like, be quiet. You know, we want to hear Jesus, Jesus speaking here. And it was, it was they who, who Jesus had come to save. You know, it was the last would be, would be first. In verse 32, and Jesus stood still. He stopped. He stopped everything he was doing. You know, the Son of God stopped everything he was doing. Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? He was there to serve them. He wanted to see what he can, what can I do for you? You know, to these outcast uh, blind sinners. And Jesus, the Son of God, stopped. He went against the fray of the multitude. He went against the flow of the world and asked them what he could do for them. In verse 33, they say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Verse 34, so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. So he saves them, and that's the compassion that we see. This whole chapter is about having compassion on the last, you know, having compassion on the weak, the, the sinner, the, you know, the harlot, everyone who, who Jesus had really come to save. So I'll end with this. You know, our God is a God who likes to take the weak, the downtrodden, the lost, the sinner, and generally those who come in last in life. You know, that's, that's who he's after because this world is not their own. They don't belong here. They don't fit in. It doesn't work out for them. And Jesus knows that. That's, that's who he came to save. He understands that, that we're only pilgrims that are passing through. This world is, is not our own. Hebrews 11.13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Okay, it may, it may look like right now that we're the last right now. You know, we're just the small, tiny remnant of the church that's left in America. Not just, not us, and just us. You know, all, all of the remnant believers throughout the United States. You know, we have, you know, there's, there's not that many left. We're, we're strangers and we're, we're pilgrims. And it doesn't always look like things are going our way. I mean, just look at these elections, you know. I still have hope that President Trump is going to win, that we're going to reform the system, we're going to have fair and free elections. But at the same time, we don't know. We don't know what the new world order is going to throw at us next because they don't play fair. 
They play dirty. They have things up their sleeve that we don't even know about yet. And so, however things go, you know, the, the ways of the world appear to be closing all around us, closing in on us, all around us. But in the end, this is the key point, in the end, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And that's us. So, let's, let's pray and end on that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for worship, God, uh, for, for your word, God, for, for praise, God. We thank you that, that you took sinners like us, God, and we're all exceeding sinners, God, before you. We're all sinners, God. None of us are perfect. None of us can measure up to your perfect standard, God. And we thank you that you came and, and you invited us into your vineyard and you saved us, God, and that we are the branches now in your vineyard. And, and we thank you for that. You know, it just reminds me of, of the Gospel of John where we have to abide in the vine in order to be effective for the kingdom of God. We're in the vine no matter what because we're saved. But if we want to be fruitful for the kingdom, we have to abide in you. And so we thank you. Help us to abide. Help us to be fruitful. Help us to be not satisfied with just being saved, but to actually work for your kingdom out of a grateful heart for saving a sinner like sinners like us. We thank you. We praise you, God. Let us be effective for your kingdom this week and into our, into our entire lives. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.